hi there, welcome. Uh, my name's Laura Hill. I head up Cloud Essentials in our UK region. And yeah, pleased to host this next in our, in our series of webinars designed to uh, help organizations tap into tap into capabilities from Microsoft um, around compliance. So today we're focusing on retention, which is a, it's a very hot topic on in amongst all of this, always has been, always will be. And our aim today is to hopefully ground you in a bit of a better understanding of the mechanics behind retention in Microsoft 365 and, and how you could maybe start to use them a bit more effectively. So the format for today is um, the first half familiarization for you with foundational concepts of retention and a live demo of a capability where your presenters are my colleagues, uh, Chris Hathaway, who champions our governance and compliance solutions, and also Johan van Schakwith, who is head of cloud for us and spends a lot of time with our clients um, deploying and, and designing how they're going to use Microsoft 365 compliance features. So we're going to move for delivery of their presentation content and then after that we're going to come off mute we're going to stop the recording and just host a bit more of an open forum where you can bring your feedback bring your questions any challenges around the topic of retention so please do type any questions into the the chat feed as we go um, and then use that time at the end to sort of engage engage with us and engage with others in, in conversation so for those who don't already know Cloud Essentials, just very quick uh, context for you. So we're a Microsoft partner around the area of, of content management. So we help organizations really mature they, their long-term approach to how they're, how they're managing content in Microsoft 365, you know, reducing the risk profile of that, migrating content in, managing it over time in a, as, as cost-effective way as possible, and ultimately opening up the value in all of that content um, that you've got in Microsoft 365. So you can you can surface it right time, right place um, to use it to your advantage. So we've been gradually working our way through the uh, the Microsoft compliance now now called Purview full offering um, in a series of webinars. So if you if you missed any previous sessions, you can catch up. Um, we'll just pop a link in the chat and you'll get it um, after this event as well to just catch up on any of the content around these these other areas. Um, and we'll be bringing more content next year. There's a huge amount of of development going on all the time um, across the the capability here. Um, so we'll keep you in the loop with that if you if you subscribe. So let's start zooming in on on retention um, and firstly just some I suppose scene setting around around why tackle it. Um, you know the likelihood is if you're if you're here with us today you are possibly heavily invested in Microsoft 365. You've got a lot of content in there and that content is is growing or you're planning to to grow your content estate within Microsoft 365 and and we'll all, with all of that, obviously, increased volume, increased complexity, you know, you'll be looking to take your stance on information governance, the boundaries around that, the compliance um, requirements around that and, and managing the full life cycle of, of the content um, that you're going to be working with in Microsoft 365. And I think the drivers behind tackling retention tend to be very well understood. You know, typically it's 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 compliance driven you know it's maybe because you're in a regulated industry and you've got very specific regulations that stipulate retention periods or or deletion um uh, capabilities and you obviously need to keep on demonstrating your ability to um you know to be compliant and your your efforts to constantly be improving your processes towards compliance but also organizations becoming acutely aware of the, the risk that they're carrying in sheer volumes of content within Microsoft 365. You know, if faced with litigation situation or breach, you know, it's likely the retention of, of a lot of unnecessary content could leave you in a much more vulnerable um, and maybe much more expensive situation. You know, well gone are the days of old of, you know, keeping all forever, um, you know, just for the sake of it. There's also a productivity conversation that does often come up, um, you know, this concept of of clutter, you know, really not not serving the organization well. So having some order in terms of retention from a bit more of an operational sense um, and of course cost, you know, there is a 
there is a, a cost to retention and your storage footprint, um, but also any any processing work that needs to be done across that content. You know, for example, e-discovery. You know, the bigger the volumes of content we're talking about, the higher the the cost of that workload to process that content to to get to relevant data, for example. So, I think this is sort of the backdrop that we see, and these, like I said, these these reasons are often well understood. I think the issue we see is. Um, yeah, not necessarily the reasoning behind taking the action, but the issue of kind of operationalizing that action, you know, making um, the decision, making the decisions that need to take place uh, prior to executing retention effectively in the technology such as Microsoft 365. So we're just going to run a little poll here just to get us um, going in this conversation of, of retention. And a question we wanted to ask to the audience today is about that progress you've made in your retention journey already with Microsoft 365. So if you just go into your, your chat there, you'll see um, uh, an opportunity to to vote uh, and submit your vote. So we'll just see the see the outcomes of that. Just give you. One moment, Let's see if the bars are changing. Okay. Yeah, so it's looking like um, for most people here with us today, they've definitely made a start and perhaps there are generic policies in place. Um, the bars are just changing a little bit, but maybe that that uh, transition between very generic policies and then starting to to refine them. Um, and yeah, we do see that you know it's only after we've got maybe the basics in place and then you you start to build on that that those nuances and 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 different situations start playing themselves out in terms of the need to to have more granular um, deployment of retention policies. And as I said before, you know, barrier that we that we see with retention, and in fact, you know, a lot of the a lot of the compliance capability in Microsoft 365 is that it's very it's very powerful technology, but it can be it can be complex. So it it does need a a team a representation in the organisation with that confidence in those controls to to understand and explain the ramifications of of deploying um, deploying the controls to the business and to the stakeholders um, involved in compliance. And yeah, bridging that gap between those policies, those classifications to making them uh, technology ready so that you can execute using native Microsoft 365 tools or, or any additional layers of technology that you need around it to make it work for your organization. So that's that's where uh, my colleagues Chris and Johanna are hoping to help you today, just a, a bit more of a, um, a confidence in, in your understanding of, of the, the mechanics of, of retention um, as perhaps you then move forth to more complicated um, situations using using retention as you carry on your journey. So I'm going to hand over to Chris and Johan. Great, thank you very much, Laura. <clears throat> and yes, um, welcome everybody today. I think this uh, really is a, um, it, it, it's a critical piece. And, and I noticed in the poll, um, there's a common starting point where we do find a lot of generic retention policies. Um, retention and disposition very much a part of the Microsoft purview compliance journey, which is know your data, protect your data, prevent data loss and, and govern your data. I think with retention and disposition, Microsoft puts it very much in the govern your data space, but in reality, it's also protect your data because if you haven't retained the information or if you've over retained the information, um, that can also be a problem. And, you know, if it's not there, you haven't protected it. And, you know, protecting it from loss is, is, is certainly is certainly very important. So um, some of the basic principles um, that I like to work through as, as part of as part of retention and disposition is really taking a step back and looking at the Office 365 and Microsoft 365 platform itself. And for a lot of our, a lot of the organizations we deal with and a lot of the work we do, we're coming off many other systems um, and lots of other infrastructure and lots of other platforms where users have been. And, and I think the, the first and most important point really is the difference between a move to manage system and a manage in place system. 
because this is going to affect where and how retention policies are put in place. So a move to manage system would be something like a legacy document management system or a third party document or content management system, or even something like a third party archive system or even a cloud based archive system. These are moved to manage. A copy of the content is taken elsewhere. That copy is protected in place and is exactly what we say. It's a separate copy. It's available for e-discovery. It's retained based on, based on the principles of that platform rather than what we call in-place. Microsoft is very much an in-place information management system. So the idea is that you manage the content where it lives, where it currently lives today, and the rules and because this is where the information is also being interacted with, it's really important to understand that, that difference between a move to manage and a manage in place. Um, so there's also a big difference between, um, and, and one, one of the things we've seen, and, and I noticed on the poll, a lot of people have said, you know, they've, they've started with some generic retention policies. We've seen organizations that have deployed um, legal holds thinking this is a retention policy, but it's really important to understand that retention and disposition policies are designed to retain and also manage the disposition of information. Legal holds are designed to override a retention and a disposition policy. So the idea and the concept behind the Microsoft platform is that you will create your retention and disposition policies, and when a legal or a forensic requirement comes along, you will have the ability to temporarily override those retention and or disposition. So if information is subject to a discovery process or a forensic process, that information will be retained regardless of a retention or a disposition policy being in place. So it's specifically designed to override them in those specific cases. And that's why we have the case management uh, and the other systems that we have in purview, and, and and if you've seen some of our other webinars, you, you you may you may have gone through some of those, particularly in the e-discovery space, where we we speak at length to legal holds. Um, the other important um, thing that that we've we've picked up over the years is it's also very important to understand with Microsoft and in-place information management with Microsoft is that if you don't have a retention policy in place you also don't necessarily have immutability. Now, immutability is the um, inability, for example, to change a record or an email or a document. And there are obviously many ways of doing that. We can have version control and we can declare something a record which will make it immutable. But from a retention standpoint, from uh, particularly on the email side, if you don't have retention policies in place, you do not necessarily have immutability. In other words, you, it is possible that an email that was sent can be adjusted or changed through various uh, various processes. Not that easy in Outlook, for example, but it is possible, and it, it is important to have a retention policy in place uh, for immutability. Which another important point is there is immutability in the Office 365 platform, and, and we do have some links available to to that that information. Um, I guess with these things in mind, um, the last point uh, to speak to really is that once you have things like retention policies in place um, and you're starting to mature in the platform, it really is a good place to start consolidating legacy content. So if you are using legacy or or, or or old uh, content management, document management, archive platforms. If you have got your house in order and you really have your governance in place, in in a you, you know you've you've made the investment in that, you are paying for it. You're already licensed for it. The platform can do all the retention, immutability, disposition that you need. So there is there is there is often little point in continuing to to um, you know, live with the expenses of, of what are potentially redundant systems. I think as, as Laura alluded to earlier, the electronic, uh, electronic discovery reference model is, a, is, is a really, it's, a, it's quite a well-known model, but I think it speaks to a lot more than just e-discovery processes. And we like to use it because 
the left hand side of this model um, and and the model is really designed to help people understand how they get to the final uh, productions um, of of information but the left hand side of the of the discovery model really is where the bulk of the information sits and where the information governance needs to happen without information governance you won't have terribly much you won't have a lot of information to that will be relevant, whether it's relevant to any discovery process or whether it's relevant to business requirements or for business informational purposes. What you really want over time is to reduce the volume of information you have, thereby reducing the cost and the risk associated with keeping unnecessary information, but increasing its relevance over time. So that it is relevant to the business that if there is a regulation or a data privacy requirement, which means you have to have it in place, or in the case of data privacy, um, something like a DSAS request, that you're able to find it and remove it from, from common access. That's also very important. So increasing that relevance, um, reducing um, volume over time is, is a really important principle of retention and disposition. Um, so, we will also, and, and Johan will will talk um, a lot more to this as as he goes through his section. But there is also the the principle of of granularity, and and as as per the poll, you can see some quite a few quite a few people, and it's really very common. Is some general ret ret retention policies have been put in place. So we put in a general retention policy for something like email, keep everything for seven years across all mailboxes or a specific group of mailboxes. The same can be said for SharePoint and OneDrive. We could have a what we call an implicit rule against a all OneDrive folders because it's a grouping of information that we can treat in a similar way. But ideally, you also want to be able to start putting disposition policies in place or disposition review, at least, in place over, over time and, and when relevant. And as you become more granular about the type of workloads and the information within your organization, you really want to start matching the different types of information. For example, if you have a specific uh, department within your organization which works with very specific information, be it be board packs or finance uh, or HR, which is a real honeypot of sensitive information. You may have very specific retention and disposition policies associated with the information in those parts of the organization. And, and that's really where you want to get to, getting to those more uh, granular um, retention and disposition policies. Of course, it is better in the beginning, in my opinion, and, and this, some people do have an opinion, Brian, to over-retain than under-retain, because if you don't have the information, at least if you've got the information, you can retrospectively change retention and disposition policies. But if you didn't retain it in the first place, you know that, that that's a real problem because the information may be lost forever. So, so rather rather have more generic retention policies in place and spend time refining them than, than of course, start with no retention policies. Um, the effectiveness of a retention policy really needs to be monitored. And, and there, is, there are really, really good tools within the Office 365 and Microsoft 365 platform for doing this. You can see the effectiveness. You can see which information is being retained. And of course, you can put things into review for disposition. Um, not only that, you can see the sensitivity and the different information types and how things are being labeled, automatically labeled, and that this, this really, particularly when it comes to retention labels, is, is really reporting, um, that kind of reporting is really important. It's an ongoing um, task. Uh, yes, there's more work in the beginning, but certainly it's not just uh, set it and, and leave it. You, you really need to be you have somebody or a group of people in the organization who have the responsibility to keep an eye on it and keep evolving and refining the retention and disposition process as you do with with the other compliance tools within within the purview stack. Um, again, consolidation. If you are going to consolidate content, you know, we've had customers who have archived email for 15 years into an archive system migrated the archive system to the Office 365 stack, but forgot to 
forgotten to turn on retention policies. You know, you've spent the money uh, to protect the chain of custody and the originality of those emails for 15 years, and then you migrated it, but you didn't set your retention policies appropriately. So certain users may have been outside of a retention policy. If they delete or remove information, um, of course, you can potentially lose the um, immutability and you can potentially lose the information through the recycle bins, which is what uh, Johan will also cover um, in a few minutes. He will he will talk to you about how the in-place uh, information retention works, where it goes and what it looks like. Um, licensing. Uh, so licensing in Microsoft is complex. Um, what I've tried to do here is distill um, is distill the sort of bare bones of, of of where we think you need to be with licensing, which is really starts with the Office 365 E3 or Microsoft 365 E3 licensing. You can also have the E1 licensing as long as you have the Exchange and SharePoint Plan 2 archiving add-on with it. You really do need to have these add-ons in order to be able to manage levers, for example, to be able to retain information once you've removed the license, moved that license to other users. And really, true retention um, only comes beyond that licensing. Um, of course, Johan is going to speak to some of the auto-labeling and, and some of the really, really cool um, features and functions we have with labeling in a minute. He will also speak to the, the principles of retention. And, and, I, and I think possibly to just make the, the point for the first time, and, and I'm sure it'll come up a couple of times in today, is, is Microsoft's Office 365 platform is re, re designed for retention to win over deletion. So if there are competing policies or rules in place, it is designed from the ground up for retention to override or beat disposition. And the longest retention will period will win over the shortest retention period. So if a single piece of information or a data source falls within two policies, the more restrictive, the one that retains it for longer will win. Um, on the other hand, an explicit policy wins over an implicit policy. Explicit policies are labels where we target specific areas or specific documents. In the, when we're speaking about deletion, the most, the shortest deletion period wins over the longest period, except to say that remember retention wins over deletion. So if there's no longer a retention period in place, the shorter deletion will win over. Um, over over the longer deletion um, in the case of competing policies um, in 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 your in your process. We will also um, give you some links. So there's some links to some some more detail on the licensing, um, which we'll make available as part of today's session, um, which gives you a full write up of 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 what that looks like. And Johan will also speak to this very useful flowchart, which is in the Microsoft documents where you really need to work through a process to understand what the what the end result will be. There are also some other tools you can use to understand your retention disposition, which we'll be covering um, as we move through the process. Um, right, so I think we've got a, another poll here, and um, I think they're, they're the poll will 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 come up and 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 the poll question is uh, are you planning to migrate legacy content or do consolidation to the Microsoft 365 platform again here we would be uh, we would be talking about um, third party email archive systems document and records management systems in the case of legal and financial and and some and engineering uh, matter management systems we are seeing quite a big uh, move with our customers towards consolidation and, and that consolidation really being driven by taking advantage of the fact that you have things like sensitive information types, the ability to use sensitive information types to identify what information you have. And once you've identified that information, be able to retain or dispose of that information appropriately because you know what it is. 
the more you've invested in that and the more you've used those tools, the more it makes sense to bring more content from these other systems, which are potentially redundant and are potentially costing you a lot of money. You know, your Microsoft licensing isn't going to change price. Uh, when you bring the content necessarily. Of course, there are some uh, limits and things like SharePoint, but overall that the cost of that compliance is 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 uh, is is, uh, is is an important aspect. So I see we have um, quite a few know all content is already in Microsoft 365 and, and, and growing, and that's great. That means that, you know, probably the more you mature, your ongoing content is being generated into Office 365 anyway. So, which is often why we see file shares or legacy systems coming into Office 365, because if you're generating it there going forward, you might as well bring the legacy data in. It helps with the knowledge management and search and user access as well. Right. Um, so I think that brings us. Um, to Johan's session, and I think he's going to start and um, give you some more detail and then take you through the demo portion of, of what we're talking about today. Over to you, Jan. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let me break it down, starting with a bit more about what retention offerings they are available within the Microsoft Purview environment. And those are really mainly broken down into two main areas, namely retention policies and retention labels. So with retention policies, you can use a retention policy to assign the same retention settings to content at a site or mailbox level um, and use this retention policy to include or exclude um, objects under those high level locations within that single retention policy. So that's what Chris meant by really implicit, where it's a high level policy that applies to a big part of your Microsoft 365 estate. Um, there's two options for applying or creating retention policies that I'll show also in the demo section, but those are firstly adaptive scopes. So those are dynamic query driven scopes um, that updates on a daily basis with a timer agent so as new content or new locations is added to the scopes, whether it's mailboxes or SharePoint or documents, those all are automatically included in the adaptive scopes. The other option is static scopes, and those are really um, limited in configuration that they are only applied to the instances um, of the locations that you define in those policies and any new um, any new mailboxes that wasn't included in that policy from the start or any new SharePoint libraries that haven't been around when the policy was created is not automatically included in those scopes. That is saying that those scopes can also be defined at an organization level. So you can have a organization wide policy set to retain content on mailboxes, SharePoint and other locations, which is your static policy. Then on the other side, with to retaining content more explicitly, you have retention labels. So there you can use either manual or automated policy and processes to assign labels to documents, folders, and email individually. Um, and those labels actually travel and is maintained with those granular items um, independent of whether are copied or moved to um, within your Microsoft 365 estate. Um, automatic labeling can um, include um, using sensitive information types, um, searching for keywords, and also using AI trainable classifiers, syntax, and the AI builder to really use the power of Microsoft AI and machine learning when identifying content and ensuring the correct label is applied to um, ensure the content of sensitive or business critical information is retained for as long as required. Two new features that was recently announced in pre public preview during Microsoft Ignite is the integration um, with um, Power Automate. So what this allows you to do is to fully customize um, how 
um, your retention labels is initiated um, with a custom workflow that you create within Power Automate. You can use this to further customize your disposition review process, by example, and by ensuring that you have a, a custom certificate of destruction um, created when you process a disposition, which in some legal instances is definitely required. Another feature that's currently in public preview is the Microsoft Graph API for records management. So this will allow customers to integrate third party and custom built solutions directly within the Microsoft record management and retention environment within Microsoft Purview and configure event based retention and um, activities. And that will allow you, for example, to start a retention policy or a disposition review the moment the employee um, resigns, or if a project um, has been closed off and that milestone reach, you can initiate a retention or disposition activity through the Graph API integration. You had um, maybe just to add the two two things that we've seen a lot of there, and and the one is that um, retention and disposition really would be very difficult to do manually. I think without the power of machine learning and the ability to put uh, more formulated ways of doing retention and, and disposition would be almost impossible in the modern, in most modern contexts or modern businesses. So it really is important to make that investment. It really does work very effectively. And uh, it's not something that's unusual anymore. It's we're seeing a lot more of it, certainly using train things like trainable classifiers and 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 also the the metadata or the content within documents to to protect, retain, or do the various things that 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 you need to do. Obviously, the ability the ability to also have that defensible deletion process is really important because the more aggressively we want to retain and also dispose of information so whether we're keeping uh, reducing our risk by keeping less information you do need to have a defensible deletion process um, and that power automate integration is very much part of that but i think johan will also demonstrate that in in disposition review which which is also a form of uh, defensible deletion thanks thanks chris so here, the next section, I just want to cover off a, more, a bit more around the how. Um, so I'm going to run through how actually retention policies and label functions within each of the Microsoft 360 workflows. So starting off with OneDrive and SharePoint. Um, so obviously to store content that needs to be retained, um, Microsoft creates a preservation hold library um, for each uh, location if that one doesn't exist. And then when a user, um, which is the first track, number one, um, either modifies um, or delete content within those locations, a copy of the original file um, and content is copied to this preservation old library. And this allows the user to continue to change the copy that they are working with in the app. Um, but while the original copy is retained within this preservation old library. That file then remains in the preservation old library um, up for up to 93 days and a timer service will check daily um, for content that is close to or reaching the end of the retention period. Um, if an item is then past the retention period, um, it is then moved to the secondary stage and um, after the next cycle run within, still within the 93 days of the next cycle of the time of job run, um, it is permanently deleted to um, reach the end of that document's life. The same happens for versions. So all versions, if when configured within the policy, is retained within a, s a single file within the preservation old library. That is a change from how it was done previously. Before September 2022, um, versions were skipped um, independently. So multiple version of, of file versions were skipped within the um, preservation old library, but currently all versions are kept within a single file in the preservation old library. Then the bottom stream number two is for content that um, is never modified or deleted. 
it still goes through the recycle bin process um, built into your OneDrive and SharePoint location, um, where it goes through the first and second stage recycle bin. Uh, so depending on whether the content was um, shift deleted or purged by the user or just shift deleted, it will move from um, the first stage to the second stage within the 93 day period before um, it is per permanently purged um, if there's no retention on those content anymore. The second one is a new feature that's also been launched um, within Microsoft 365 retention, and that is to apply a retention policy or a label to cloud attachments. So cloud attachments are those links or files that users embed in messages instead of attaching the files within the messages, the legacy way of sharing content. And what this label allows you to do is to ensure that that content is also retained um, within the preservation library. Yeah, yeah, um, maybe just a really important point there. Um, again, if you're using a third party system, it's really whole, it's really difficult to one manage cloud attachments and to be able to search and e-discover them because a third party system just doesn't know what the concept of a cloud attachment is. Um, and from a, both a preservation and an e-discovery perspective, that can be really problematic down the, down the line if you've adopted the Office 365 platform and your users are sharing information regularly and sharing those what we call cloud attachments. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Johan. Hey, Brian, Chris. Um, so even if a user has not um, applied a label or there's no retention policy applied to the original copy of the file before they add it as a cloud attachment, the policy allows you to, the moment it is attached to or embedded within an email, it again creates a copy of that file in the preservation of the library when it is shared with the external party or the internal party. And similar to SharePoint content and OneRush content, it goes through the preservation hold and recycle bin um, stages before after the retention period has lapsed being permanently deleted. So that's quite a, a unique, useful feature that Microsoft has released um, lately. Then moving on to Teams. So behind the, behind the scenes, um, Exchange mailboxes actually use um, mailboxes to store a copy of data that must be retained. Um, um, but that means even though you might have retention policies um, configured for mailboxes, you still need to have retention policies that defines Teams channels and Teams chats before those content are retained. So you might have mailboxes under retention policies, but if you don't have your team set up for retention, those messages is not retained as part of the, the mailbox retention policies. So if a chat then the first um, the first part around how content is retained and deleted, if a chat or channel messages is deleted or edited, um, a copy of that chat is stored within the sub chat folder. So that is within the recoverable items folder within the mailbox, which is a hidden system mailbox that can not be interrogated by any application or client. Um, it can only be searched and discovered through e-discovery searches, the content within that recoverable items folder. And that copy will remain in that location until the retention period has lapsed. And then that chat item will be deleted um, between one and seven days. And that date range is because of the, the schedule and the time period that's currently running on Teams content, which Microsoft is um, is changing. So it's currently run to set to run at least twice a week. Um, so it's typically permanent deletion will happen anything from one to seven days. Then the second stream is just for content that is never um, edited or deleted. So it will stay stay active. Um, until the retention period um, it has lapsed. If that retention period has the deletion included, then it will go to the substrate, the recoverable items folder within the mailbox and remain there for anything between one and seven days with Monday being the minimum. 
and then only after uh, the next cycle, so at maximum another seven days before that content is actually permanently deleted from Teams. The same applies for YAML. So YAML content also utilizes mailboxes for data retention in the back end. So when community or user messages is retained, um, there's two streams for content and how it is actually retained um, in the back end. Again, the first stream is for content that is modified or edited. A copy of the original version, again, is copied to the substrate or recoverable items folder where it again remains until the retention lapsed and then it is permanently deleted if that is the result of your retention policy. And similar happens to, to team chats, to YAML messages. Again, if items is not deleted or edited, that original message unedited retains or remains active in the YAML client or YAML location until the retention and deletion policy has lapsed. And then there's the double cycle process of soft deleting to the recovery items folder before permanently deleted at the end of the um, deletion process. Probably the most common one that I think most people are already aware of is how actually retention works within um, Exchange Online, but just to um, refresh everybody's minds again. So, um, mailboxes has got a very couple items folder um, and content that is either um, needs to be held with a retention policy or a retention label. Um, if it's been copied or edited, a copy of that message is copied to a folder um, within the recoverable item folder, and it will remain there until the retention period has lapsed, and then it will take the normal deleted items retention period before actually being permanently deleted. So the default is 14 days, but this can actually be increased up to 30 days before content is permanently deleted after the retention period has lapsed. For content that is not edited within the mailbox or public folder, that content will stay active. And then once the retention period has lapsed and there's a deletion action, that, that item will follow the same process as normal deleted items, where it will be retained for up to 30 days and by default 14 days before it's permanently deleted and purged from the environment. A very important thing to note around the retention labels and very important disposition is an important limit that you can't apply any, you can't publish any retention labels, or you can't apply retention policies or disposition actions on mailboxes that is less than 10 megabytes. So it's it's something that Microsoft is working on, but new, new mailboxes, it, they might be included in some retention policies and label policies, but they will not see anything published until the mailbox actually exceeds 10 megabytes. That's currently the status in today's world. The next section is just covering off um, deletion of content when item is or content is placed on hold. Essentially, when we need to respond to DSOS and data subject and access requests or when there's data spillage. Um, and it's very important because organizations might have data that's unintentionally retained due to their retention policies in the recoverable, recoverable items folder that must be deleted to um, adhere to legal or other instructions. Um, and those two scenarios, as mentioned, are data spillage and where you, you internal or external um, senders might have sent sensitive or business critical information and that content needs to be deleted. And if it's under retention, it's a bit manual process to actually delete that content for mailboxes. And maybe so and just to remind everybody, the reason for this is <clears throat> retention wins over deletion in our rules and in our in our, our basic rules of retention and disposition. Thanks, Chris. So there are currently limitations. There is a defined manual process for delete content from mailboxes through the Google Items folder. I'll cover off that on the next slide. 
but there's really limited options for retention or delete, deletion of content from team, SharePoint, OneDrive, and Yahoo that is currently under retention policy. Um, and there you would really rely on third party tool sets to, to bolster that functionality. So Chris, I don't think we're gonna mention that just before. Yeah, I think to... what we've seen in, in practice is where there is a specific or a likelihood of these requirements or where there is very specific uh, disposition required, um, we see people use third party systems to do either backup or, um, you know, systems that are very integrated to, into Office 365 that still use Office 365 as the backbone, but for example, will have associated Azure storage built into the platform so that you're actually able to then not set such such restrictive retention policies and you're able to use the retention based in your Azure storage to retain information. Uh, anyone is welcome to chat to us if you have a very specific requirement or a very specific workload where you are likely to be subject to DSAR requests. Bearing in mind that DSAR requests are the, the, the rule and, and the law is depending on you know which data privacy um, regulations you need to adhere to, but in general, most data privacy regulations will say that where there is an overriding business reason to retain, you may retain. Yes, you can give the DSAR requester a, uh, a copy of the information, but if you're entitled to retain it for business or, or regulatory, other regulatory reasons, you should. There's also um, some, some arguments about, you know, once it's moved to the deleted items retention, it's not only available to an e-discovery process that may also be okay in some scenarios. But otherwise, yes, absolutely, third-party um, uh, storage management and backup solutions are, are being used, and, and we are doing some of those for quite a few of our customers where they have a, 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 you know, that specific requirement to be able to uh, retain and dispose of information uh, outside of the outside of the more general um, Office 365 retention rules. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, Chris. So the next slide is really just high level process of how you can actually can delete content from mailboxes that's currently under retention policies or have content with retention labels. So firstly, you need to collect properties from the mailbox because after the process, you need to return the mailbox to the original state so to continue normal operation. Then that will lead into preparing the mailbox so that you don't lose any content and you can actually delete the content that is required. So there you need to disable client access to the mailbox. So that's really, um, um, it, it impacts the business where users won't be able to access this mailbox for this process while this process is running. So it's in, it's disruptive to your business and really uh, that's why important, defining and ensuring your retention policies are defined correctly will, will have a less of an impact on your business when it comes to actual responding to these um, deletion requests. And then once you've removed client access, you need to increase the deleted items period to 30 days so that you don't purge data through this process or unintended data. But then you also need to disable single item recovery so that the items you actually purge um, it is not retained as the normal deleted item retention process. And lastly, very important is to actually dis disable the manage folder assistant. So that's a back end Microsoft process or timer service that actually kicks off the, um, the timer and the jobs to, to check and verify and apply retention policies to content within mailboxes. If you don't disable that, um, content will continue to be deleted and purged or retention will continue to be applied to those content. I think, Johan, I think the point is that where you do have a very specific uh, legal requirement to remove information that has that is on retention um, and you don't want to inadvertently lose information uh, that's also on retention, it is quite a complex process. We highly recommend speaking to someone like ourselves or someone similar because the chances of you either over or under deleting are quite high. You really need to follow a step-by-step -step process. It, it, there is some disruption, as Johan mentioned, because you have to remove access to those users that, that, that are affected. 
Um, and and it's a it, it's quite a process. So it does happen. Yeah. We have had to do it on a number of occasions. But I think the point is there is a way of doing it, but it, but it, but it's a reasonably complex um, process, which which you 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 should really ask for some help for if you need it. Yeah, correct. Just to summarize quickly at the end of, um, not to get into too much detail, is then you need to remove all the holes from the mailboxes, um, to remove the delay hold, which Microsoft um, applies when you remove a hold. So it's like a backup from Microsoft. Then through e-discovery searches, you actually need to delete the content from the, the recoverable items folder. And then lastly, you read the mailboxes to the previous state. So yeah, like Chris mentioned, it's really a complex process. And if you have a lot of mailboxes to follow this process for, it can be quite involved process. So that leads me into the last three areas and um, three demos. The first one is just explaining and showing a static retention policy. So let's jump into that. So uh, you'll see on screen your Microsoft Purview Admin Center and to apply a policy, you can click to the policy section and then to the retention area. Um, and it will go to have a shortcut to the data life software management area for retention policies, where you'll see a list of current retention policies that's configured within your environment. And to create a static policy, it's simple to click on a new policy that will follow the wizard to initiate the process. Starting off with giving it a very descriptive name. You'll see when it comes to utilizing the policy lookup and also defining a good description really assist administrators to see what the policy actually does. As mentioned, you've got adaptive and static. And here is the high level areas that we can apply a policy on. And as, as mentioned, you can have a combination of um, locations on and off and also include and exclude objects within each of those work streams within a single policy. Then if you click on next, the options to retain content, then there's really three main options to retain content for a specified period. You can also create a custom one we define days, years, or months. And then what you can do at the end of the period, either delete content automatically, do nothing. Um, and then there's two last options. If you don't want to use time-based, you can just um, retain content forever or also just delete content after a certain age. So those are the three, three actions that you can, or actions that you can apply to static retention policies. And once you click next, once you've selected, you'll see a summary and you'll get a warning of what will actually happen to content. And very importantly, you'll see if there's a deletion, it will warn you that content is going to be deleted. The next demo is just an interactive guide of adaptive policies and adaptive scopes. So let's jump into that. So starting off with the creating of the policy, again, we're back in the dashboard where you can create retention policies. The same uh, static, you start the same process by defining it a pr proper name that can be descriptive to include more information of how content will be retained. And then on the next screen, instead of selecting static, you choose adaptive. And here is where it changes a bit. Here you'll see you'll first have to have a scope already configured which I have for this environment. I've got a finance user scope. Once I've selected the scope, then I can turn on only locations that is limited to options within that scope. So here I can only turn on exchange and wonderful, for example. It's got the same screen as static then, so the same rules apply on this level as static. But very importantly, and here comes the, the flexibility and dynamic is where you actually define adaptive scopes. So as you can see, I've got a basic for this demo of a, a adaptive scope that looks for the department um, where that attribute in AD is set for finance. A demo to create an adaptive policy, just to show you what the possibilities are. Again, you can create a, a scope, then you can have an adaptive scope for users, SharePoint sites, or Microsoft 365 groups. So, Depending on what options you choose, you will have different options to create 
the rules for um, actually the queries for defining um, the, the, the content that must be retained. So for SharePoint, you can have SharePoint lists or defined strings. So you can define a string such as the GDPR um, and that retention policy will look for that string across your SharePoint environments to ensure that that scope uh, identifies that content. For users, it's all the Azure Active Directory attributes that you can use to build the query. Um, so those are the options for adaptive scopes. Then lastly, the last demo is just the demo for retention policy troubleshooting. I'm actually using, utilizing that workflow that Chris showed earlier. So let's jump into that. So you can see my mailbox I'm logged onto, um, and I've got a few items. But quite interesting, the last email in my mailbox has got a deleted after two days retention label applied um, and a date that it should have been actioned but it hasn't actioned yet. So we're going to use a combination of the policy lookup tool set and this workflow to identify why this, this content was not automatically deleted. So let's run the policy lookup feature. So here you can define a search. I'll just search for my mailbox. So I can get a list of all retention and um, retention label policies that is applicable to my mailbox. So there is the list of all of the retention policies and labels that apply to my mailbox. So let's follow the flow diagram starting with the top. Determine when an item will be retained or deleted. And the first question is, is the retention label applied? Um, that answer is yes. From previous scene, we've seen that it, there is a label already applied, but we can verify that. by just jumping into the area and see, yes, that label to delete after two days is correctly applied. So we move on to the next step. The next question, is there retention configured to retain items? So that's not something I can see on the mailbox. So let's use the policy lookup to confirm if there's any retention defined. The first policy is no retention, just deletion after one day. So that there's no retention there. And moving on to the second policy, the policy is just to delete after 14 days, and that's the label. So there's definitely no run retention there. But here we can see there is a retention policy defined to retain content for seven days. So there we've got the answer already for that question. So that the answer is yes, we moved down and down the middle path. The next question there is then from the applied label and all policies is. Um, is it after the longest retention period for the item? So then if I jump back to my mailbox, sorry for the video to end. So here the retention is set for seven days. So let's jump back to the mailbox. So it is not after seven days. This is on Wednesday, the 19th of October, um, and it was the 21st. So here the answer is that the content would have been retained because it's not after the longest retention policy. That's basically me for the demo, a bit more on what and how. I think we leave it over to Laura to wrap up today's session. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Johan. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so just last, um, lastly from us, you know, today we've kind of walked through the why, the what, the how around retention in Microsoft 365. But as I mentioned at the start, we, we often find the biggest challenge can be um, kind of operationalizing how you manage retention on an ongoing basis, which is often more of a who story. Um, certainly the most effective deployments of retention um, that we have seen is where organizations have almost created a sort of vehicle for decision making around their governance and compliance and, and where that executes 
in technology and have perhaps formalized a bit more of a program around that um you know created for themselves a, a home a, a forum where it can communicate all these nuances of of the technology to the business um and compliance risk and communicate the policy and key key stakeholders can kind of ground this whole conversation in the reality of their operational issues you know the people the process the the behaviors at play around the content um and everyone can sort of align against a roadmap and decisions can get made and, and those kind of feedback loops as maybe you you test the technology um you know have a home and you can just generally speed up your response around retention and that's certainly something that um, as an organization we we're supporting our clients in um, so yeah just to, to finish up on our last slide then there are there are several ways that we might be able to help you as an organization depending on your where you're at in in rolling out retention and if there are any specific situations that you wanted to um, to put to your hand then please please go ahead and do so and contact, contact contact us.